Okay, so I'm uh, Blair. I'm the Managing Director of Kinect Medical Communications. Uh, most of you probably never heard of it because we don't tend to do too much in New Zealand. Um, so this is just a standard industry thing, part of what we have to do. Uh, I don't have any potential conflicts of interest that I, I need to uh, let you guys know of. Um, but, so what I want to do today is because, when I think about it now, it's a long time since I actually left, left university and I think some of this is going to show my age a bit now. Um, but I think the most important thing that I can do for a lot of people here is actually show you my career path. Because I started out in uh, the health sciences first year, uh, it was a bit easier, well I realised it was actually 20 odd years ago now, um, and I probably failed. Uh, I, knew, I missed out on med school. <laughs> yeah, giant failure. Um, yeah, I missed out by one mark. Uh, I know exactly where that one mark was uh, in my first year. Probably the best thing that ever happened to me, to be honest. Uh, and I ended up going, I thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a scientist. I did my undergrad in uh, pharmacology and toxicology. Uh, initially planned biochemistry as my second option, but I, I yeah, really am a pharmacology nerd. Uh, so I um, thought, yeah, I'll do that. Did my PhD, but I didn't want to be in the lab. So I went and became a lawyer. Uh, if you're all science students, there are, there are no law students here? Yeah, no. You, if you're, as a science student, you go and sit in law lectures. Completely different kettle of fish, eh? Uh, I didn't last long there um, because I failed. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't actually, I don't know what my second year marks were. Uh, I know I failed the, the, the mid year, which is a hell of a shock. When you come from being a scientist and you're kicking ass at everything and you're really good at what you do and you go and do law, and you're stuffing stuff up and everything's great and it's like, no, I'm a scientist, there's an answer, there's a right and a wrong. What do you mean the opposite answers can be right? No. Nah. Um, and to be honest, uh, you've probably seen a lot of the Me Too movement and all that sort of stuff about law firms. I, I saw way too much of that and things that I didn't like culturally there, so I got out. Uh, and I actually spent 12 years as a combat specialist in the Navy. Uh, as a reservist, uh, six, six months in the regular force. We all think we, that's us, as far as we're concerned. Nothing like that whatsoever. Uh, usually out of here, it was on a tiny little patrol craft, uh, dealing with everybody incredibly seasick. Uh, last thing I did was fail. Uh, two weeks into a, into a uh, damage control course, last half hour, I screwed up royally, put the danger, my team in a lot of danger. As a result, boot off the course, get out, you failed. Cost me a promotion. It hurts. Uh, but, you know, part of the lesson from this is this is how many times I have failed at what I did and how many times I've changed career since I uh, first came to uni. So I thought, oh yeah, right, stuff all this. I'm going to the UK. Going to go on an OE uh, to show my age a bit. Went to Manchester, Oasis, probably dated as hell now. Uh, saw these guys live in Manchester uh, just before they, they never played a live gig again. Right in the middle of the GFC uh, up in Manchester, where you're just another foreigner trying to steal their jobs. Uh, and they don't know Kiwis up there, it is England. It's not London, it is England. It is a very, very different place. Mind you, that's just a kind of a, a, a blip in the road uh, compared with what we're dealing with at the moment. So that was a giant failure doing that. I, I blew somewhere in the ballpark, uh, and this is in 2009, of 10 to 15, 10 to 15 grand. Uh, I was so broke that I went on a train for an interview, it cost me 13 pounds, and I thought I absolutely balls it up. I couldn't afford to stay, I couldn't afford to come home, and who the hell is gonna employ a PhD pharmacologist in New Zealand when you come home? I was, I was actually on my, just about on my way back to, the, back to the Navy, and then I fell into med comps. It was the last thing I wanted to do. No idea what I was doing, they asked that in the interview, do you know what we do? Uh, kind of made something up about what I thought they, they do. Um, but it turned out it was just the, what I wanted to be doing. Great fun. Um, so what Medcoms is, is we sit somewhere in between the pharma companies and the doctors. Because doctors are busy. If you go and tell a doctor, hey, great, you've gone and done that clinical trial, you've had 20,000 patients, uh, great, uh, can you write up uh, the results from that? And they will go, did you just come in through uh, my waiting room out there? Did you, did you see how many sick and dying people there are in that waiting room? I don't have time to sit here and write all this stuff up and come up with a presentation for that conference and all that. Uh, but then you also don't want the pharma companies running rampant with this sort of stuff because they'll, they've got a, a very heavy incentive to make things sound a lot better than what they actually are. So part of my job is to basically sit in the middle. 
on one hand, if I'm dealing with the, the doctors, I put my commercial hat on and say, okay, we need to kind of think about how we phrase this, make it sound a bit cooler, uh, things like that. If I'm dealing with uh, the pharma companies, we put the science hat on and say, hang on, no, come on, guys, back this up. You, you, no, you can't say that. Uh, you need to behave yourself. There are a whole lot of ethical standards uh, that need to be met, and it's our job to make sure that everybody's playing by the rules. Uh, last thing I want is somebody accusing me of not playing by the rules because that will send my career down the drain. Um, probably an interesting thing that I've just noticed in the room as well, very he heavily female-dominated industry. I'm the only male in our team, and there's five of us. And all my bosses, all the, so many of the people that I've worked with have been women, and uh, in all honesty, women do tend to be better at the job than men because there's a huge amount of attention to detail, a lot of uh, management, a lot of uh, relationship uh, building that has to go on. Um, and see, the, the problem that I've kind of found finding now is that, and I'm sure a lot of you have probably started to encounter this or thought about this, is that the door, what's even worse now, you can't even get out of the country, uh, but the doors are being closed overseas to young New Zealanders. If you want to go to the US, that's pretty difficult. You want to go to the, you can't even, I went over the issues that I had trying to get a skilled migrant visa when I went to the UK, you can't even get that visa anymore. And if you try and go over there on a two year uh, working holiday visa, uh, the likes of the medical communications companies just go, nah, you're going to be going home in two years. So it's getting incredibly hard. And then this is what you quite often face in terms of what you see you come into in New Zealand. It's a chicken and egg situation of everybody's going, well, hang on, I don't want to graduate. Most companies go, I don't want to graduate. I'll tell you why I don't want to graduate, because a graduate is going to cost me at least 100 grand. Because I've got to train them up from scratch, I've got to spend all my time with them, I've got to hope that they don't take all those skills, all that time that I've put into them, and I've left and taken it to another company. Uh, that's the, the, the business side of things, if you want to be a real mongrel in business. Um, but what we actually do is we've trained everybody who, from scratch who's coming to us, because I can't just go down the road and find a medical writer who's got the sort of experience uh, that I have. So, uh, for example, the first account that I ever worked on in a medical writer was worth four, bi four billion US dollars a year in sales. We were flying plane loads of people from China into Copenhagen in Denmark for a conference just on this drug. And I'm sitting there as you know, a 29 year old Kiwi with the top guys in colorectal cancer sitting there running through their slides, getting a private education about what they're doing, how they do it, absolutely cutting edge stuff. So uh, we found a, I came back home, found a clinic in 2012. We're now at a team of five, probably six by the end of the year uh, because. Uh, medical communications is quite a defensive industry and um, everything's really kicked off. Right, the day that we went into lockdown, I was fielding calls from Sweden from people going, we've got a clinical trial going, we need you guys in now to help us sort out, figure out what's going on, give us a hand, get onto it. So uh, the team were uh, having a lot of fun. So um, we're largely working in a freelance medical writing capacity, but now we, we've actually got, uh, we're in the middle of launching a very specialist pharmacology thing. So really you kind of got to be the pharmacologist to understand that. Uh, but we started out with one client in the UK. Uh, now this is a bit out of date now. We're up to um, a little bit of formatting problem there, but uh, 14 countries I think we work across now and we handle about 300 projects a year. So there is, every day I wake up and find out what we're doing and how much is coming through. And uh, we're working on, uh, so this is, uh, yeah, top 20 drugs uh, as of a couple of years ago. And I don't, yeah. Uh, we've worked on 17 of them. So we've had our fingers in just about every pie imaginable at a global level. Uh, like I say, we don't do much in New Zealand. In fact, we don't really do anything in New Zealand. Uh, and we, we're actually shifting out of Asia because it's just not, just not worth it. So we largely work in the US and Europe. Um, and this is, of course, whether it's been working in law or working in medical com communications, uh, this is sometimes what you do face. Uh, particularly if, you, if you're coming from an acad academic environment, if you're doing a postgraduate sort of thing, is that you've sold out uh, if, you've, if you've gone to the private sector. I've been lucky that my PhD supervisor didn't really agree with that. Uh, but also a lot of people go, oh, you're a medical writer, so you ghost write papers for doctors. You, you know, doctors just rubber stamp stuff and stick their name on it. Uh, no, it couldn't be any further from the, uh, from the truth. I certainly won't tolerate that. My team won't tolerate that. And this is an example of why I say that. You know, so I've led the development in, uh, across the Asia-Pacific region of good publication practice guidelines. Uh, so that was all through Asia. Uh, and everybody goes, says, oh, well, you know, you, you go into the private sector, you won't publish papers. 
Uh, this is one of the papers that we've published. Uh, there's also another one if anybody's doing some postgraduate research. We just published another paper in PLOS One uh, about how our open peer review, the open peer review process is being corrupted by the peer reviewers and how often, and all your, anybody who's doing postgraduate research, anybody who's published a paper, you've all done it, where you realise you know who the reviewer is and they say, hey, look, can I uh, suggest that you add this paper? The, the stats that we found when you actually look into that are shocking. Uh, something like 45% of, of the papers that you read have had a, uh, a reference inserted to get on side with the reviewer because whoever did it realised that uh, the reviewer uh, related to the reviewer. So that's an example of everybody kind of says, well, you guys must have sold out and you're not doing any things. Well, we've been publishing pretty regularly as part of our, actually part of our training program for uh, science communication grads who have come and haven't done any bench work. First thing we did was put them through uh, a publications program. So how do you get a job as a medical writer? As I mentioned, and it's kind of come up, chicken and egg situation. Uh, this is what you want if you're a medical communication agency is we charge our time. So any time that I'm spending not writing is effectively costing money. Uh, and that means training people. Uh, but the bigger problem is, you know, if you're, if you're a graduate, you want to go into a job that's well paid. Medical writing is incredibly well paid because there is a global shortage of medical writers. Uh, my team uh, could pretty much walk out and go anywhere in the world if they wanted to, straight into a job. Uh, but that's the sort of thing when you're talking about the um, cover letter that you're, that you're writing for employers. Uh, I tend to give some pretty blunt feedback on some of the, the cover letters that we get written for us because it's like you're telling me about you and how this is going to benefit you and you have no idea who I am, what we do, uh, and how you're going to benefit. Uh, and also with LinkedIn, LinkedIn's a great place to be, but if I don't see that you've looked at my profile on LinkedIn, don't take a knife to a gunfight. When you come in to an interview, I know everything about you. I have looked you up on social media. Uh, for one of our past guys, we, we had the photos of him doing Edward Scrumpy Hands in a Toga on Facebook. <laughs> And he had no idea. So lock down your Facebook, think about your social media, because we will, we will do that. It's fair game. Employers will do that. Uh, so yeah, do your homework if you're going for a job. You can easily go on LinkedIn, find out everything you need to know about me, all about my background. I'm going into an interview tomorrow for, for something, and I've already found out some very important information about the people that I'm going in to speak to, because I know that they're going to have questions for me that I wouldn't have expected if I didn't know what their background was. Um, You've also got to realise, if you're coming from a university background, you're starting over. Uh, especially for PhD grads, they tend to come into our office, think, yeah, I've got my PhD, and then they realise they're just like when you come to university, you're a fresher again. You've got a lot to learn, uh, you probably don't have the experience, and it pays to listen, and it's attitude. Attitude sells more than anything. Bad attitudes will see my team, uh, prime example, uh, what I do, I leave my team with potential candidates and in interviews because you'd be surprised what happens as soon as I walk out. As soon as you, you leave two young females uh, with whoever's interviewing, all of a sudden certain things will come out that they won't dare try on with me. Uh, and that's cost people jobs. So that's just a, an interesting thing to think about is make sure that you're always giving a good attitude no matter who you're dealing with because you're dealing with a team. You're not de if you come to Kynec, you're not dealing with me, you're dealing with my team. Uh, and be prepared to be patient. Uh, it's not easy. If you put the work in, uh, then the opportunities will come for you. Okay, thank you.